Major League Baseball stadiums might not have the size of NFL stadiums or the intimate atmosphere of NBA slash NHL arenas, but out of all of North America's leagues, it has the most interesting venues in my opinion. Pretty much every ballpark has a ton of different quirks, different seating options, and the way they pay tribute to the city or team's history is unparalleled. So with that being said, here are the Major League Baseball stadiums. American Family Field, Milwaukee Brewers. We start off with one of the more distinctive ballparks in all of baseball. In particular, the unconventional fan-shaped roof, which I believe is the only one of its kind in the world. It's a pretty cool design and looks like two giant arch bridges from the outside. From the inside, it has a bit of an industrial look, with exposed steel everywhere. There is plenty of natural light that flows into the stadium though, and that is important because unlike some stadiums with a retractable roof, this one has real grass. But they do actually have to bring in those artificial sunshine lamps to maintain it. If you're like me and were curious about that big yellow slide over there, well, the mascot, Bernie Brewer, slides down it after the Brewers hit a home run. So you know it's been a good game for the Brewers if the mascot has a mild electric current running through him. Angel Stadium, Los Angeles Angels. It's one of the few stadiums to initially be built as a purpose-built baseball venue, then converted into a multi-purpose stadium later on, and then converted back into a ballpark successfully. The most famous feature here would have to be the big A sign, which is as old as the stadium itself, but it's no longer in the stadium itself. So the most famous feature within the stadium itself sits where there was a grandstand during the football days, and that is the rather spectacular man-made waterfall, or cascades I guess. Yeah, other ballparks have water features, but none quite like this. You might wonder why they went for such an extravagant display. But then you remember that the team was owned by Disney in the late 90s when this was added. And then it makes perfect sense. They probably got the same people that worked on Disneyland rides such as... Uh... I'm not much of a Disney person to be honest. They have more refined taste in entertainment. Spongebob mainly. Bush Stadium, St. Louis Cardinals. It was built roughly on the same side as the previous Bush Stadium, which was pretty much the perfect example of a concrete donut. Of course, they don't make concrete donuts anymore because too many cops were breaking their jaws. Actually, no, I hate that stereotype. Everybody likes donuts, of course cops do as well. Anyway, it features some more bridge action, except this one intentionally looks like a local bridge. But that doesn't come close to being the most extraordinary structure you get to view while visiting the stadium. The seating bowl opens up to a rather splendid view of the St. Louis skyline, including this monochromatic rainbow thing known as the Gateway Arch. That's another aspect that I love about baseball. Due to the nature of the playing field, it allows for outfield seating to be kept minimal, which allows for some stunning backdrops. Chase Field, Arizona Diamondbacks. This boxy looking ballpark has one of the earlier examples of a retractable roof, and that's why as you'll see later on, it's not as sleek as some of its more modern counterparts, particularly from the outside. But I'm sure the Diamondbacks fans could not care less, because it's protecting them from what is some of the harshest sunshine of any MLB city. Also, the inside is what matters most and it's looking pretty good. It has a fairly similar layout to Milwaukee, but with three tiers instead of four. A few other differences are the fact that they recently replaced what was a natural grass field with synthetic turf. Also, all of those big windows over there can actually open and close. And there is a nice little swimming pool to cool off at. I don't think it's quite big enough for everyone at the stadium, but it's better than nothing. City Field, New York Mets. It was built alongside the Mets' former home, Shea Stadium. An iconic venue, but one they would have been pleased to move out of, especially when this is the alternative. The facade resembles Ebbets Field, a former stadium in the city that was demolished before the Mets even existed, so that's an interesting choice. I suppose it's better than replicating the exterior of Shea Stadium, which made commie blocks look avant-garde. There is at least one tribute to their previous home, and that is this big apple known as the Home Run Apple. This one's actually from Shea Stadium. But on the inside, there's a new one specifically built for City Field that rises after a Mets home run. 
I believe these were commissioned in an effort to prove that the Mets were New Yorkier than the Yankees. Oh my word, more bridgeage. This one's a replica of Hell's Gate Bridge which connects Queens and Manhattan if I'm not mistaken. What's with baseball and bridges? Citizens Bank Park, Philadelphia Phillies. Straight away you'll notice the roofs done up in that distinctive shade of green known as Copper Patina, aka Statue of Liberty, made of copper, turns green over time, hence Patina. Anyways, rather nice. Not that you get to see much of it when actually attending the stadium. What you will notice is that the seating is very angular. Usually behind home plate there's more of a curved seating bowl. You'll also notice that the field is sunken into the ground. 23 feet to be precise. And there's a giant replica of the Liberty Bell, complete with a crack. Yet the sound is perfectly normal. Something's not right, I'm thinking this bell is about as genuine as Taco Bell. At least it won't give you diarrhea. Actually, you know what? I don't want to get sued by them. What are real are the trees that make up the batter's eye. That certainly beats a blank wall, at least aesthetically speaking. America Park, Detroit Tigers. Once more, the field is sunken into the ground quite deep, so the exterior is one of the least imposing you'll see. But then again, there are some giant tigers outside that can roar. And their eyes can light up. Actually, no, that's just the ones on the inside, but these ones have recently taken up karate. It's jiu-jitsu. Oh, jiu-jitsu, sorry. So they more than make up for the less imposing exterior. Since Chase Field converted to synthetic turf, this is the only keyhole path remaining in Major League Baseball. It's just a strip of dirt, I know, but it was quite common back in the day. And I'm glad there's at least one example left. Well, there are plenty of minor league ballparks that still have it, but this is lost in the big leagues. Coors Field, Colorado Rockies. Would you be surprised to hear that this is the largest ballpark you'll see in this video? Not the capacity, but it features the largest field in Major League Baseball. This is to compensate for the dry and thin air that you get in the Mile High City which offers less resistance to the ball whilst in flight, and as Einstein taught us, mass equals acceleration times gravity and such. The feather, the feather will fall at the same speed. Oh, and speaking of the mile high city, the field is actually just below a mile high. It's not until the 20th row of seats that you get a mile above sea level, as indicated by the change in seat color for that row. And if you're sitting a little higher up on the right, you're treated with a stunning panoramic Rocky Mountain view. Ooh, more trees. Except these ones are almost a mile high. Take that, California Redwoods. Think you're so tall? Dodgers Stadium, Los Angeles Dodgers. When the Brooklyn Dodgers moved from the aforementioned Ebbets Field, they decided it was easier to build a new stadium in a giant ravine on the other side of the country than to find a suitable site in New York. A good decision, there are certainly less rain delays here. The field being so far below street level on this side means there really isn't much of an exterior to speak of. When this was built in the early 60s, it was getting into the era where multi-purpose stadiums were taking hold. But thankfully there was no need for a new football venue in the city, so it was built as a baseball specific venue. And unlike Angel Stadium, remained that way throughout its history. It's actually the biggest baseball specific stadium in the world, but it's technically not the biggest MLB stadium. I'll get to that later. Don't be fooled by the fact that the field faces away from the city, that doesn't mean it lacks a spectacular backdrop. Quite the contrary. There is some very Californian looking nature beyond the outfield. Any redwoods? No. Fenway Park, Boston Red Sox. It's the oldest major league venue. In fact, an easy way to grasp its age is that it opened less than a week after the tight... Uh, block your ears if you haven't seen the movie yet. Just five days after the Titanic sunk. In the movie, of course. It didn't actually happen for real. It was just a conspiracy to sell more iceberg repellent. But anyway, it's old. I usually like to point out what is unique or unusual about a stadium. Sometimes it's a bit of a struggle, but not with Fenway. There's no other stadium like it. Firstly, the dimensions. 
the outfield seeding. The green monster, which is the biggest outfield wall in the big leagues. The combination of modern luxuries and antiquated design elements. It's like stepping back in time without the fear of polio. One downside for the locals is that due to room constraints, it has been unable to expand to be big enough to meet the demand. So that disparity leads to the most expensive non-premium tickets in baseball. Still worth it though, it's like a museum and ballpark in one. Well, pretty much every stadium seems to have some sort of museum nowadays, but you know what I mean. Globe Life Field, Texas Rangers. From the oldest ballpark to the newest, Globe Life Field replaced the undesirable due to lack of roof and Texas Sun Hot Globe Life Park, now called something else. It's located right nearby, as is AT&T Stadium, making this small patch of land in Arlington the most fertile stadium growing area in the world. The roof of the new venue, which is the biggest of its kind, does come in handy. But it's the aesthetics that let it down a little bit. It does look like it belongs on a farm from the future. I like to call it the world's first billion dollar barn. But the interior is one of my favorites. As is becoming a bit of a trend, there are so many tiers of seating, seven in some areas. I'm sure it costs more to build, but it really does allow for few, if not no, bad seats in the house. Even the top row has a good view. I particularly like this section, it's almost like a modern take on the balconies at their old ballpark. One slightly unsettling upgrade from their old stadium is that they had to make the seats wider. I mean, that's a good thing, but for the wrong reasons, I guess. Great American Ballpark, Cincinnati Reds. The Reds aren't being especially patriotic with that name, they just accepted a large sum of money from an insurance company to have the stadium named after them. But then again, ain't that what America's all about? Oh, and these things as well. Wait, forget about the pickup truck. Is that a real riverboat right there? No, that's just a riverboat deck, which includes a covered bar and dining area for all your eating and drinking needs. Wait, are they real smokestacks? No, they're just fake ones that can pour out artificial smoke to create an atmospheric spectator experience. These river themed features are of course due to the ballpark's location right by this long windy lake thing, which can be viewed when sitting higher up in the stands. Contrary to all the features on the inside, the exterior is a little bare bones compared to most, but it's still alright. Guaranteed Rate Field, Chicago White Sox. There's no questioning whether that's a sponsor's name. People give it a lot of hate for that name, but there are certainly worse names out there. Like Kenneth. But don't get me started on the team name. If you're gonna name yourself specifically after the color of a particular garment, at least be true to your word. The Red Sox wear red socks and the Reds wear red after all. Kinda. Some designs are ahead of their time. This one was probably a little bit behind the times. It looks like a bit of a combination of Angel Stadium and Kaufman Stadium, which were built in the 60s and 70s respectively. Another downside is that rather than a downtown view or a mountain view, it's a view of the hood, if I can say that. This is the south side of Chicago. Perhaps that's why they sort of blocked it off a little bit. I will say though that I do appreciate a homage to the past. And the facade is basically a modern take on Comiskey Park, their iconic former home. Just with a bit of a tan. Kaufman Stadium, Kansas City Royals. Just like its football counterpart right next door, Kaufman Stadium is nearly 50 years old, but it's a design that has pretty much stood the test of time. It might not be the most aesthetically pleasing, particularly the exposed concrete exterior, which was very common back in the day, but renovations over the years have added some nice modern touches, and overall I think it looks rather nice. I like how the top tier of seating comes to a point, matching Arrowhead Stadium. Actually back in the day they had matching seats as well. The video board here is huge, for a while it was the king of all video boards, the biggest in baseball. But as you'll see later on, it has been bested. It kept the crown because... You know how much that would cost to move to Cleveland? Oh, spoiler alert. It has a seemingly serene backdrop. 
but there's actually a major highway right there. Lone Depot Park, or Lone Depot Park in American, Miami Marlins. This is one of the more distinctive designs in baseball. Instead of the tried and true retro classic or retro modern that were the go-to options when this was built, the Marlins went for a more futuristic take, which resembles an arena more so than a ballpark, particularly the exterior. The Jetsons-esque design certainly isn't for everyone, but I applaud them for daring to be different. And I'm not sure a retro stadium would suit Miami anyway. I mean, how many bricks do you see here? An Art Deco design maybe? Red brick? I don't know. Anyway, I didn't actually need to show you stock footage because you get a great view of Miami's skyline from the seats, due to these sliding windows. I love that asymmetrical scoreboard, but one thing I wasn't a fan of initially was the shade of green that they painted the outfield walls in. A bit garish, but thankfully they changed that. Another thing they changed was the natural grass, which was recently replaced with synthetic turf. I guess year on year the synthetic turf is getting better and the cost savings become more attractive. Minute Maid Park, Houston Astros. It was the first MLB stadium to open in the 21st century. And as you can see, they still hadn't quite perfected the retractable roof aesthetic design yet. But it's a little bit more interesting than Chase Field, from the aerial view at least. The best part about this stadium is probably the fact that it was built on the site of the former Union Station, and they incorporated some of the building into its design. Okay, that doesn't look all that special, but due to this history, the Astros wanted to keep going with the locomotive theme by adding a train within the stadium. Yeah, sat atop this old-fashioned stone viaduct looking thing is a full-size model train. I hope it's not powered by coal because in lieu of trash cans, smoke signals might be an option. Uh, behind the train is the world's largest sliding glass door, which slides along with the roof, so the stadium really opens up. There are a ton of gimmicks here, it's pretty far from a purest ideal ballpark, but it's fun, you gotta give it that. Nationals Park, Washington Nationals. I'd imagine that at least a few dozen tourists over the years have wound up here when they meant to visit a national park. But who needs Yosemite when you have these drab facades made from steel and glass? Wait, Yosemite? They must have really gone off course. Anyway, calling it drab was perhaps a bit harsh, but just comparing it to some of the others we've seen so far, it kinda is. The interior is a lot better in my view. Speaking of views, Washington's skyline is not the most grandiose, but features some of the world's most famous buildings. Look, there's the US Department of Transportation building. One day I'll see it in person. As a bit of a nod to the ballpark's proximity to the US Navy yards, they've included a foghorn which sounds off after every national's home run. A surface-to-air missile was deemed over the top. Bit of a shame. Also, I could be seeing things, but this section here reminds me of an aircraft carrier. In a way. Sort of. No? Not seeing it? Alright, let's move on. Oakland Coliseum, Oakland Athletics. It's a stadium with a prestigious name that it doesn't live up to. Actually, you know what, perhaps Coliseum is the perfect name for it. Just like the one in Rome, it's crumbling, it lacks any shaded seating, and it has a sewage system that predates toilet paper. Hence the large amount of foul territory. Okay, we've got all the negatives out of the way, let's talk about the positives. Uh, field? Field is good. Nice grass. Oh, and it actually has a few hundred more seats than Dodger Stadium, but thousands are topped off. Which leads me into my least favourite feature. One of the most frustrating design elements of any stadium. And that is Mount Davis, an extension that was added for the Raiders and now sits there with a tarp on it serving no other purpose than blocking what was a decent panoramic view and rubbing salt into the wounds of the downtrodden people of Oakland. Okay, I don't want to sound like they've just been through a war, but the Warriors go to San Francisco and the Raiders leave to another state altogether. That's a tough pill to swallow. Hopefully the Ace can stay and build themselves a new home. Oh, I mentioned San Francisco, here's an interesting little tidbit. 
If you are standing up top on a clear day, you can actually see Oracle Park, home of the San Francisco Giants. Ignore the fact that I used the Oakland Coliseum's non-commercial name just so it would be right behind Oracle Park in the alphabet. In order to do this smooth transition, I just I, ignore that. I want to keep it smooth and and um. Now I forgot what I was saying. Oh yes, they're the only two stadiums in Major League Baseball that can see each other, so to speak. But when you're sitting high up in the stands of Oracle Park. I doubt you'll even care that you can see another stadium. This is one of the few examples where a lack of available room actually enhanced the sports venue. With the right field wall being just 45 feet or so from the ocean, it leaves most spectators with a stunning view across the bay. If you're worried about the balls floating out into the ocean and causing global warming or something, then don't. There are usually fans waiting in kayaks for a splash hit. But not only that, there are actually dogs that swim out to collect the balls. Who knew you could train a dog to fetch? A lot of ballparks have big Coca-Cola signage, but the Giants have a huge bottle. Quite fitting, I guess. Oriole Park at Camden Yards, Baltimore Orioles. This place is held in very high regard, and there are a few stadiums in the world that can claim to be more influential. You might even say it was the world's first influencer, if it wasn't for the fact that it commanded respect. Anyway, what I'm referring to is the fact that it was the first of the retro classic ballparks. At least in the majors. The red brick, the steel, the green roof, the green seats mimic the design of a bygone era, whilst adding some modern touches here and there. It's just such a clean, simple and elegant design. It's kind of similar to Oracle Park, in particular the way that it looks like it's being cut off. Except this time it's not by water, but by a warehouse. Which has actually been incorporated into the stadium itself. Just like the train station at Minime Park. Within it are stadium related offices, as well as a restaurant or two, team store, etc. But its main purpose is to shut up and look pretty. It's the icing on the cake of what is a fantastic venue. Actually, you know what, scrap that, it's cheesecake, it doesn't need icing. Petco Park, San Diego Padres. This one features facades made from Indian sandstone that were built in a bit of a Spanish style. Two countries that don't typically have much to do with each other. But man, if Spain colonized India, the food would be incredible. I can only assume some sort of curry burrito would naturally arise. Anyway, the exterior was actually inspired by the cliffs in the area. Yet again, they've incorporated an old building into the design of the stadium. This one's a lot closer to the field. It pretty much forms the boundary. The building had been declared a historical landmark, so I guess they had no choice, but who knows? Maybe they would have kept it anyway. Probably not. Unlike the warehouse, of course, this has been hit on multiple occasions, even up onto the roof. Interestingly, just outside the park is a park, known as the Park at the Park, where fans can actually watch the game from. It's open to the public for use as a regular park when there's no game on. PNC Park, Pittsburgh Pirates. We've got a limestone facade this time. It looks kind of similar to the sandstone we saw earlier, but it tastes considerably better. Better texture as well. That is just a personal preference. Anyway, this ballpark is often touted as being the best in the world. And that's not because of the exterior. It's largely because of its location, which provides one of the best backdrops in sport. Yes, you've got the Pittsburgh skyline and the Allegheny River, but it's those iconic yellow bridges that make all the difference. The Roberto Clemente Bridge, named for the Pirates legend. The Andy Warhol Bridge, famous artist. And the Rachel Carson Bridge. Uh, just stunning. I never thought I would talk so much about bridges in a video about stadiums. But then again, I was just talking about tasting limestone. Other than that though, the stadium's design goes for function over form. It's an understated design with just two tiers of seating. There's not much in the way of gimmicks or sideshows, and there doesn't need to be. It's a fantastic venue. Progressive field for a progressive team now known as the Cleveland Guardians. It was the right move to drop the Indians nickname in my opinion. Kinda racist. 
Now hopefully the Cleveland Browns will follow suit. The exterior is actually quite similar to Petco Park, just a little more stripped down with less stone and more exposed concrete. But the steel is painted white as well, including the light towers which are a well known feature here. There are just so many of them, 19 in fact. Usually there's like, what, like 6, 8 maybe? Come to think of it, Cincinnati had pretty much the same toothbrush design. Uh, but it does have some other distinct features like the little green monster. I guess they could have called it the green gremlin, but then again it's not that ugly. The venue also features a surprising amount of luxurious amenities. My favourite being the Terrace Club restaurant. I don't know what the food is like, but it just looks cool. They've also got the biggest video board in baseball. It's basically the opposite of the one in Kansas City. Very widescreen. Rogers Center, Toronto Blue Jays. Okay, so as far as facades go, this is the most boring one you'll see in this video. But the stadium distinguishes itself not only by the fact that it's the only Canadian MLB stadium, but it was also the first with a fully retractable roof. A style of roof that has still not been replicated by any other team. I would say it was a completely unique design, but actually this stadium in Japan has a very similar thing going on. It was built four years after Rogers Center and well, the Canadians are too polite to say it, but they copied the design, didn't they? Or maybe not, who knows? This is just one of two football baseball hybrid stadiums remaining in Major League Baseball, Oakland Coliseum being the other. It hosted the Toronto Argonauts until 2015, which is why it has a disproportionate amount of outfield seating. You can tell that this would have been an incredibly impressive venue back in the late 80s, and even though it's lacking in certain areas nowadays, it's still a pretty cool place. T-Mobile Park, or T-Mobile Park in American. I don't know why I keep doing that. Seattle Mariners. This venue is also known for its retractable roof. No, not simply the fact that it has one, but the fact that it sort of hovers above the stadium, rather than actually sealing it shut and turning it into an indoor venue. I don't mean that it actually hovers, of course it is on railing. Just I want to make that clear. Which is good I suppose if you like an open air feel, but it does make it seem as though it was retrofitted to a pre-existing outdoor stadium, instead of both the stadium and the roof being designed as one as they were. That's probably partially due to the fact that there is a separate canopy underneath the retractable roof. Anyway, it's not all about the roof. The interior features the second largest screen behind Cleveland, which is great for people that struggle to see at all. And if you're sitting on the right side of the field, you not only get a view of Seattle, but of another stadium. Target Field, Minnesota Twins. The Twin Cities have some fantastic stadiums, and this one's no exception. Ah, oh, Twin Cities, that's why... That's why they're called the Twins. I love these facades made from different shades of tasty limestone, but most of all, I really love the lines on this stadium. Not the foul lines, they're pretty standard, but you know, in the same way you would describe a sports car, the design has a certain flow to it. One strange but interesting feature is, well, see how there's a section of seats in the middle there that's a different color? Well, that's because they're actually wooden seats, the backs of them at least. This was purely an aesthetic choice, and it adds a little bit of an old-fashioned charm to an otherwise modern venue. It's a fantastic ballpark, but one downside is that it's the farthest north Major League Stadium that doesn't have a retractable roof, so it might get a little bit chilly from time to time, but no big deal. Tropicana Field, Tampa Bay Rays. The exterior is a little blamange. In the literal sense, see, it looks like one of these things. In fact, in 2016, it was voted as the ballpark most reminiscent of an obscure dessert. Another poll that it ranks highly in is the worst Major League ballpark, although Oakland tends to take the title. In reality, it's not a terrible stadium, just by MLB standards, it's not great. It's the only remaining Major League venue with a fixed roof, but I suppose if it was going to be anywhere, it should be somewhere where the humidity is high and hurricanes are nigh. It's the smallest Major League stadium, officially. However, that is simply due to the large amount of seats that have been topped off. 
There are seats with an obstructed view due to these catwalks. But it's not as if they would have been filled very often anyway. Something I find odd is that when the Rays played their first season here, the stadium was already 8 years old. Truist Park, Atlanta Braves. This is the farthest ballpark from downtown. The Braves made the move from very near the center of the city out to the suburbs which is closer to the center of their fan base. Clearly it was a prudent decision because they averaged the second highest attendance last season. And I can't think of any other reason that would be the case. They sort of brought the city with them though. Next door they built this entertainment district called the Battery Atlanta. The ballpark itself features the largest canopy of any outdoor MLB stadium. Still small by European football standards but its purpose is to shade rather than shelter from rain. It's a compact venue where all the spectators are quite close to the field. But I'm disappointed with one thing. The home of Coca-Cola doesn't have a giant Coca-Cola bottle, just a lousy sign. It does however according to a lot of people have the best food of any ballpark, and I'll take that any day. Wrigley Field, Chicago Cubs. The name has a somewhat similar story as Bush Stadium. It's not named after Wrigley's the gum manufacturer, but the man behind Wrigley's, coincidentally named Wrigley. It's a toss up between here and Fenway Park as to which is baseball's most iconic venue. Obviously age has to do with that. And given its age, there's no surprise that it does have some restricted views and is lacking when it comes to modern amenities. But much like Fenway Park, it makes up for that with some very interesting quirks. There's no green monster, but the outfield wall here is also unique. Instead of padding, it features the more elegant looking brick walls covered in ivy. It's not poison ivy either, so you can eat as much as you like. Other features that make Wrigley stand out are the hand operated scoreboard, the famous marquee out front, and of course the rooftop seating on the adjacent buildings. Yankee Stadium, New York Yankees. Being the most successful franchise in MLB history, they built the most expensive stadium in baseball history at well over $2 billion. The Red Sox might have the most expensive standard seats, but the Yankees have the most expensive premium seats, some of which can go for up to $10,000 on the secondary market. And actually a bit of a criticism of the stadium is that it seems to cater for the wealthy more than most. Though in many ways it's a flashy modern stadium, there are several nods to the old Yankee Stadium, such as the limestone facade, as well as this frieze that runs underneath the roof. And of course the dimensions are the exact same. And really overall it just looks very similar. The Yankees got off to a great start here by winning the World Series in their first season at the stadium, but they've yet to win one since. You do have to question whether it was worth nearly three times the cost of City Field, but I guess it probably does generate a lot more money. And those were the Major League Baseball stadiums. If you enjoyed the video and you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing. Thanks for watching, have a good one.